Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you to the college tonight to uh, uh, our uh, illustrious affair. The format of the college consists of the following. First, we have our <coughs> announcements period. Then our speaker will speak up to about uh, an hour. Then our speaker will speak. Then we'll have a question and answer period followed by our infamous rebuttal period. There are two rules to the College of Complexes tonight. The first one is uh, no personal attacks, and the second is one fool at a time, or vice versa. Um, you know, if you guys are ready, uh, Charlie, if you want to go ahead and uh, proceed with the announcements, I'll get everything ready for you here. Okay, <laughs> welcome everyone to meeting number 3,683 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. As usual, we begin with a recommendation that you join our Google email group in order to receive announcements of upcoming program, not much traffic. And we also have a meetup group, which functions in much the same way. So I highly recommend that you subscribe. It takes only a few seconds to either one or both of those. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Coming next week, September the 17th, Jan Lee, from the Every College Regular, is putting together uh, a program on global issues. She poses the question, should we engage in collaboration or confrontation? Always put together a very thorough and detailed presentation should be enough to discuss there. Transitioning into uh, the 26th, we are having an author. This is a book that's gotten some nationwide attention. Nevertheless, we persuaded the author to come and how cl climate change will result in a class warfare. You'd better believe it will. Okay, and why we're gonna have to need to embrace socialism as a solution. I'm all for that. Transitioning <laughs> then to October, uh, we we have a we have an, a, a a segment of the college which meets once a month to discuss philosophy. That we're going to be discussing the philosophy of anxiety. Someone has called this, you may have seen the book, this we are living in the age of anxiety. Anxiety is fear of the unknown. Uh, so explore this topic of, are you receptive to change in the future? Or are you fearful of it and receding? Fearful and receding, come on. Okay, on October the 8th and 29th, we have vacancies. I'm working on filling these. We may have a Congressman. I'm looking at either one of two Congressmen to come in here. And we also may discuss there is a referendum on the Illinois ballot regarding uh, the establishment of organized labor within the state of Illinois. So we may have two speakers um, on, on, uh, on either one of those topics. On October the 15th, um, my own state representative, Teresa Ma, uh, we'll be giving us a presentation on the fairs in Springfield, Illinois. She has agreed to come, and we haven't covered state of Illinois issues, so that should she's a, a relatively new member of the uh, General Assembly in Watch in in Springfield, and uh, making her way and making her mark, uh, representing people from. She takes advice from me. So she's, she's got to be successful, you know. Okay. Um, and then on October the 22nd, um, we're going to have a good one. How to be an informed voter. We're going to look about who is going to be on the ballot. Take a look at the independent voters of Illinois. Take a look about these endorsement processes. But anyhow, everybody should be an informed voter. I always am, are you? If you would like to be like Chuck, then come to this program. 
These people are seasoned veterans from various areas in the political spectrum around Chicago and Illinois. So they know what's happening uh, in the state and will advise you and they recommend uh, how to proceed on election day so you can be like me, an informed voter. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it then. Uh, October the 8th and 29th are open though. If you have a topic you'd like to speak and have not done so before, please let me know. I would like to know that we had brother, rather abrupt apologies from one of our panelists. He has some personal issues uh, that precluded him, Tom Berry. So you will not be able to join us tonight. Uh, I spoke with Tom and uh, he's got some issues that have to be taken care of. Uh, so we appreciate what Tom has been doing over the years of the satellite campus of the college, but he extends his apologies. All right, take it away, Timmy. Okay, and uh, we're gonna have two speakers tonight. Um, the first one's gonna be Anthony Padilla, or do you want me to call you Tony? Tony, be fine. All right, Tony Padilla and then Charlie Paydock. So I'm just gonna let it go here and uh, let you guys go ahead and get started and introduce yourselves in the topic. So it is requested that everybody mute themselves while they present. So let's take it away and uh, go ahead, Tony. We'll be looking forward to your presentation tonight. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me start by uh, telling you who I am. Uh, I'm Tony Padilla and I was national legislative and political director for the uh, Old Bragg Brotherhood of Railway and Airline Clerks, which turned into Transportation Communications Union. And in 2005, we merged with the International Association of Machinists and, and, uh, and Aerospace uh, Workers. Uh, I've been affiliated with, with the union for 50 years, uh, serving, of course, the community and, and the activists, both in the railroad industry and the community. I trained uh, to represent retirees at the uh, William uh, Whippensinger Education Technology Center in, in uh, Hollywood, Cal uh, Cal uh, Maryland. Currently, I'm vice, um, I'm a national legislative, I'm sorry. Currently, I'm area director for the uh, National Association of Retired Veteran Railroad Employees. Uh, I just gave up my uh, title as vice president uh, in May. Uh, it, it, I, I had some health benefit uh, issues, so I didn't. I didn't want to continue being covering the whole nation. I retired in two thousand and nine from the railroad union, again as national legislator and political director. Uh, and uh, it, after uh, after forty three years, I retired back to my hometown in Austin, Texas. And uh, I, I have been a uh, vice president of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, uh, you know, as one of the affiliates of the AFL-CIO. I'm currently vice president of the uh, Alliance for Retired Americans and also regional director of the Alliance for Retired Americans. Um, now, just to let you know where I'm coming from, I lobbied for the Texas legislature for 20 years and uh, in, in, uh, with the Texas AFL-CIO committees representing bro the real brotherhoods and, and uh, railroad workers. I, I was one of the original lobbyists that created Amtrak. Uh, I was working for the Southern Pacific Railroad at the time when, when Amtrak uh, when the railroads decided to do away with Amtrak. And so I lobbied both in the state and all the way to Washington DC. And I became one of, the, one of their uh, lobbyists. Consequently, in, in taking care of that here in Texas, I was promoted national legislative rep and moved uh, uh, to DC in 1989. And kept on working in, in Texas and in the uh, and in the national level. I was one of the uh, 
delegates for the National Convention for Walter Mondale. And uh, I have been attending all the Democratic conventions since Mondale to today. I, I started working for BRAC for TCU in November 1st, 1966. I was a railroad clerk. I worked at just about in every position that you can think of in the railroad. Uh, and then I, of course, uh, you know, started working for the passenger service, became a station agent in San Antonio, Texas. That's where I stayed, Amtrak took over and I chose to, uh, after five years, to move uh, to work for, uh, uh, for, for, for the railroad, for Amtrak rather than, than, uh, than the railroad. And uh, I've been affiliated since the very beginning of 1966 as a union employee representing railroad workers. So that's, uh, that's where I came from. And uh, now, as you guys know, in my days, the railroad industry was very different. There was a lot of discrimination back then uh, for uh, blacks and Hispanics, but I was able to get into the railroad at the time because I was, I was uh, referred by the Dean of the, of the community uh, college there in, uh, <clears throat> in, in San Antonio after completing a, uh, a degree in, uh, or, or a certificate on accounting. So he sent me to work as an accountant to the railroad, but I didn't work but one day because I got bumped the second day and that's the story of my life. All the jobs that I worked and I worked them all, I got bumped in every, every for every position. The railroads paid very well. I was a butcher for uh, one of the grocery stores there in uh, uh, San Antonio. I was getting paid $1.15 an hour. Uh, and, and when I went to work for the railroad, when they told me how much they wanted to, uh, they would be paying, I didn't believe it. So I told them I didn't want the job because I wouldn't qualify for it. I was disqualifying myself, you know, uh, being the thinking that I wasn't qualifying. But anyway, I went to make an application anyway, uh, and and I got hired right after applying. And so, uh, uh, in, in working all that time with the union as a union rep, I always worked in the legislative end of the of the union, and like I said, all the way to Washington D.C. So I've seen, I've seen the the uh, the changes in the railroad industry. There, there are uh, setbacks, there are advances. And, and of course, during this time that Charlie uh, uh, wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, the railroads are, are very much behind with probably maybe about 50,000 employees short and they still don't wanna hire anybody unless you have a degree of some kind, they're not hiring. Uh, when I started, there was no problem like that. Uh, once I got in, I, I got my brother to join the Southern Pacific uh, Railroad, my, my other brother, my sister-in-law, and, and then on Amtrak, they all stayed with Amtrak as well. So we, uh, we come, now I have a lot of members that are retired from the railroad industry. The Railroad Retirement Board finances our retirement, and it's a very, exclusive uh, uh, retirement that pays very well, great benefits. And of course, unlike the regular, uh, re regular railroad worker, as a union officer, you have other, other uh, perks that uh, the regular union guy don't have. For example, in your, in your social, uh, in your healthcare, you have a second to none, uh, healthcare uh, coverage that so I never have to pay anything for going to see a doctor or having whatever problem I may have. Both me and my wife, the spouses get a retirement as well. And, and uh, so they have a very, so we do have a very hefty retirement account that we would not trade uh, in any way. Uh, better get that phone off the hook. 
And so uh, that's where I'm coming from. I've seen strikes throughout the, uh, throughout the time that I worked for the railroad from the time I was in San Antonio. And strikes really don't last too long because the railroads cannot operate. The country stops, it freezes. Uh, if, if, we were, if we went more than four or five days, you know, you would really cripple the, the country. You wouldn't have any groceries in the stores and, and, or, or, or commodities of any kind because you'll run out. So usually the government gets involved. Usually we, we get presidential emergency vote boards to, uh, to mediate for us. And it's not good when the Republicans have it, when they, or when they are in control, we don't get us, we're not as well covered. But when there's a Democrat in control, like it is right now, we get a lot of benefits. We just got done settling a, a presidential emergency board intervention uh, and, and put us back to work uh, with uh, uh, making sure that we got very hefty uh, increases in, 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 uh, in pay, back pay as well for not, for not uh, bringing up the contracts up today. They pay us back for whatever they didn't pay. So we got back pay. We got additional vacations. Uh, you know, the, uh, every two years, the, the, the railroads, and the unions file what's uh, is called this, the uh, section six notices. And the railroads always start. We taking away your sick pay, taking away your vacation, take, reducing your, your pay and all that. And of course we, uh, we fight that, you know, to make sure that we don't lose any of the benefits that we currently have. In fact, we always get a, a better a better uh, contract after the PEBs. And we've had, I've, I've lived through a lot of the PEBs. My main job in the, uh, in the railroad union was to uh, uh, lobby for the, for the Rail Railway Labor Act and all the labor laws. And I even helped the railroads lobby for the things that they want. After all, they are our employers. So we help them uh, to do what they need. So we have a, we have a very, uh, in, aside, aside the negotiations and all that, we have a very good relationship with the uh, management. And nothing can be done in Congress unless both the railroads and the union agree to whatever changes we, we want. I was working uh, for, uh, for the union to pass the Railroad Retirement Act of 2011, which uh, allowed the, uh, Railroads to get railroad employees to be to retire at the age of 30 with 60 years uh, of service, and about 56,000 employees retired when that passed in, on that day. So the railroads were yelling out for uh, making sure that they get coverage of workers, and they eventually did. But the main thing is that we got covered. We got a real good uh, retirement on account of it. The most important thing that happened during in that bill was that we created our own uh, uh, retirement uh, fiduciary people that would that would do a railroad retirement. So there's three railroad representatives of the union and also of the uh, of the company, and the three of us make a decision as to where we invest our pensions. And believe me, the first year we got $17 billion ahead. Right now we got like $21.8 billion in the account. So our, our account is probably solvent for the next 75 years in the future, unless something goes wrong. And something goes wrong is, is gonna affect the whole country. Our railroad retirement is, covers uh, social security as well. We uh, we have a tier one, which is railroad retirement and tier two, which is railroad, the railroad taxes. They combine the taxes together to come up with our railroad retirement. Now, uh, as I said, you know, we, we've had uh, shortcomings and advances in the railroad industry. 
And the bad news with Amtrak was that they, I, I was the guy, the guy that uh, lobbied for Amtrak for 45 years until I retired in 2009. And I always managed to get enough funding to keep it going, to keep it alive. Every two years of Congress, they introduced three or four bills to get rid of Amtrak. We don't need it. Too much money, you know, this and that. But these guys don't realize that this country needs a passenger service, just like the airlines have. They invest more money on, on airlines and, and, and highways than Amtrak would ever use. So it, it, it's pretty unfair for the government to, to choose who they want, but they know who are the supporters of those issues. And of course, Amtrak was always started, but why? Because we are union employees that are being taken care of now. All the railroad, uh, the railroads uh, have members on all the crafts, clerks, engine men, switchmen, conductors, and they always want to reduce something, they want to take something away from you. The two men crew, they wanted to have, we used to have like three representatives uh, in, in, uh, in the rail driving an engine, and then they reduce it down down, uh, they took out the, the firemen, uh, and, and now we have the conductor and the engineer. And they wanted to take that for the last five years they've been fighting, but we also fought very hard. And on this potential emergency board, board we were able to, uh, to keep the three, the two members of the, uh, of, of, of the trains running. So we've been successful in some some cases, you know, uh, taking under consideration that we also have some setbacks. So if there are any questions, I'll answer uh, uh, after Charlie uh, Payda makes his uh, his comments. But you know, you should know that Amtrak suffers because we always late, or we were always late until we instituted a a, a penalty for the railroads. Uh, it, when the uh, train ran, ran late. And so that improved a little bit, but it doesn't stop, you know, we're still late every, and, and that's because we don't have a siding to take, to, to take the, the uh, freight railroads on the siding so Amtrak can get by. So they take advantage of that. And, and, and so we, we the, the passengers uh, in the country suffer because of it. And this last uh, uh, presidential, uh, uh, regime that we had under President Trump, he tried to, in fact, he if he'd have stayed president, we wouldn't have an Amtrak today. He proposed to take down Amtrak completely. All the, all the long dis, distance trains would be discontinued and probably the only thing that would survive was the uh, Northeast Corridor. But we were able to save all that and thank goodness Biden came back and he has been a champion for Amtrak for all those years that he's been there. And I worked with him for the last 45 years, you know, while he was in office, I lobbied him. He was our champion on, uh, for Amtrak, uh, as well as the uh, Murray from Washington State who funded the, uh, uh, the funds for Amtrak. Uh, and McCall, uh, and, 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 and a senator from Maryland, uh, I'm trying to think her name now, it's been, it's been 10 years that I retired, Mikulski, I think it was. Anyway, those, those are the, the champions that used to save our railroads and our Amtrak passenger train. Charlie? All right, thank you very much uh, for coming. First off, coming out tonight and a nice, overview of the situation regarding uh, from the perspective of the employee. Okay, uh, as way of introduction, um, I'm Charles Paydock, and for many, many years, I've been in, involved in the history of railroads. I most recently worked on a very extensive lecture, which can be viewed online on the anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad. 
which was a tremendous effort on my part, enormously detailed, thorough analysis of what that all involved, celebrated every year on May 10th, the uh, Transcon Railroad. Uh, other things I've done, I'm in several railroad clubs and historical society, the Railroad Station Historical Society, to go to different parts of the country. Uh, we recorded every railroad structure in the nation. Um, the, I always say at the railroad clubs that we should restrict membership to experts. And at the end of this evening tonight, I hope you can qualify or at least fool your friends that you are a railroad expert. Um, I also have been a lobbyist for many, many years for Amtrak within going to Washington. Um, I lived in the third district under the Lipinski, Congressman Lipinski and father and son, which district is unique in the sense that it had more trackage uh, than any other congressional district in the nation, uh, route miles um, it, within one district. So the, there was a topic of concern. You can see my concern. Uh, I attended to that as well. I was involved in establishing the High Speed Rail Association, which has now gone nationwide. And I'm also the uh, executive officer of a project in New York and Chicago Railroad, um, which is a project to develop high speed 220 mile per hour train service between Chicago and New York City and all the cities in between. Okay, I put together a quick PowerPoint. Um, okay. Work, Timmy? Tim? I don't seem to see this on the screen. We see it. You can see it? Well, I could, but it just went away. Yeah, oh. Charlie, we can see it. I was just uh, number two. Yeah, are you there? Where are you go for a walk? I uh, went to the washroom, Charlie. There it is. <laughs> OK, that's, that's all. I'm going to I got to finish up. Uh, I got to finish up my nature call. I, I can't see it on my screen. Uh, Charlie, uh, we can see, uh, go to turn, turn off your full screen because we're seeing, uh, we're seeing the, uh, 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 quote, uh, 21 magic quadrant from eating solutions. Probably go to another, uh, uh, go back and turn off your screen view. <coughs> just, just turn off your screen. Okay. Um, now we can see something in there. Uh, yeah, you see, you, 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 we can see your screen on your computer. And now we can see that we can see pipeline fighter in the picture. So you got the screen there. But you got to go to your PowerPoint now and just pull it up. We should be able to see it then. You there, uh, Charlie? Yeah, I, I'm not having any success with this. Uh, pull up your PowerPoint again. So you had your PowerPoint up, right? Remember? I tried. Um, Just look at me. Okay. Pull up your PowerPoint and then share screen. Because we had it working earlier. Okay, we can see screen. Is it up? No, it's not up yet. We we had Charles Paydock has started screen sharing. Okay, pull your PowerPoint up again. Okay, here's screen share. Okay. Pull up your PowerPoint. Let me make certain it's open. Okay. It may not be open. Um, open your PowerPoint while you're thinking about it. Open up your yeah. PowerPoint. There. Okay, open it up and then uh, just go ahead and now screen share on the PowerPoint. 
when you go share screen, you should show you several open windows. There you go. Okay. All right, everybody got it? Sorry no, for yet. my uh, big yep. challenge here. Okay. Uh, Charlie, we don't see it. Well, I can see it. Uh, go to share screen. Click on the PowerPoint icon where the PowerPoint presentation is at. See the green button that says share screen? Hit no one You see it, Charlie? You've done this before. Yeah, but it's not cooperating. Okay. Uh, share screen. Okay. There's the thing. Now hit share. Okay. Uh, you have to make board? him uh administrator or whatever it's called no he's he's got he's got things okay charlie we can see her just go to your powerpoint now on your computer just stay right where you're at go to your powerpoint presentation yeah okay so there you and go. now we can see it now don't do anything but we can see it now go ahead and uh share a slideshow from beginning now we can see it now we're oh, good all right okay there we go we're all set Okay, uh, these are some facts about freight railroads. I'm a passenger guy. I don't have any love for the freights. Uh, so if you're, the issue we have tonight is that there is a gridlock across the nation in the freight rail systems. Now, some people are critical of communism. They're saying it doesn't work. Well, this is a very good example of how capitalism doesn't work. Now, gridlock is <coughs> usually come about if when railroads merge. If you take two big railroads uh, and you merge them together, there's a, a period where they haven't quite operations worked out. And gridlock often occurs, meaning the gridlock means these trains are backed up one after another and they're not going anywhere. And a guy getting an engine sit there for all day long, at the end of the shift, get off and somebody else go back on. So it's very unusual though that during this period, there has been no such mergers, no identifiable reason for it. And that's what we're gonna look at today. I think I've got my reason, I talked with Tom, about what have the railroads been doing lately that this should come about. Obviously there's some form of mismanagement Okay, there's the conductor. By the way, the conductor is in charge of the train. Uh, at the engineer, at the conductor is ready for all of us to get on board uh, and go. One topic I won't cover here tonight are rail yards. Central to the operation of railroad system are, are the, I don't know, I think there's about 39 uh, rail yards. I don't know the exact total, large and small. They're sprinkled across the Chicago metropolitan areas. The class one railroads all maintain gigantic yards. Um, the, uh, the, like by my house down in Bridgeport, we have the uh, Norfolk Southern Yard. Go a little further south, you got Santa Fe, which has several things. As a matter of fact, right by my house is a very small UP yard. Uh, so they're all over the place. And this is one of the, this is somewhat what do you think a gridlock takes place? Those aren't going anywhere. Now in the United States, trade has moved in different ways, rail, water, pipeline, truck, and by air. And the freight railroads do the vast amount of it. 40% of freight of the United States by ton miles. And you can see there how it's divided up in, into the various uh, modes of transportation. It exceeds trucks um, and so forth. Now these, I, I've got about four slides here with facts. I'm gonna read these for you. I didn't have time to put this together. I took, I did, I had one hour in advance. So I put this together, but here's important things you need to know about what's going on here. But Illinois is the center of the rail network. There's 7,709 uh, miles of railroad tracks, um, or 9,000. 
across the state of Illinois, almost 10,000 miles of railroad. Uh, we talk about class one, two, and three railroads. We'll learn further. There are eight class one railroads. These are the big ones. Uh, class two and three are usually class two or regional. Class three, they're all over probably 500 of those. Short lines, they call them. Uh, so that's basically, you have, you have class one railroads, regionals, uh, short lines. Now in Illinois, 41 railroads currently operate in Illinois. That's probably more so than any other place. Uh, they range in size from short one mile in a state carrier to larger railroads east and west. I actually know buys the one like railroads of one mile or two. Uh, <laughs> there was a guy who fixed engines and he bought a, a short line. He operated with his son and his teenage pal. He had one employee. Uh, but seven of the eight uh, carriers and uh, 34 regionals based out of Chicago. Uh, and all four of railroads are able to provide in the United States. Chicago is the gateway to the nation for the nation's rail center. There's another center outside East Louis. Um, 1,000, uh, uh, also 1,300, well, 300 freight trains pass through the Chicago area every day, 1,300 trains a day. Um, and we're ranked first in the total rail volume. We have, in addition, four inner city passenger rail quarters uh, that connect to 32 Amtrak stations across Illinois. Now, what they call here, not only do you go to a train station, but 14 of those stations have what they call integrated transportation, meaning you can get your bus someplace else, or there's other means. Okay. Um, now, altogether, there are 630 railroads that operate across the nation. And right now, there's 140,000 mile of track. At one time, we had over 200,000. Uh, I think 220,000 peak to right, right after World War I. And there you can see the list at the top of the major railroads uh, that have merged beyond Burlington North Santa Fe, UP, Canadian Pacific. Canadian Pacific is a unique railroad in the sense that it goes north and south. All the other railroads are east to west. By the way, all trains are identified as going either east or west. Um, CN is another Canadian-based railroad, and the Kansas City Southern, actually, which may also be another Southern. They're ones that were trying to, KC Southern is trying to work with shipping goods to and from Mexico. What's the largest Union Pacific? At Omaha, Nebraska. Now, they're, the other, all the major ones compare it to this size. They have 8,300 locomotives. Um, let's see, what else? Um, they, uh, they, the average power, they're pretty powerful these days. 6,000 to 700, 7,000 horsepower. Um, they last about 25, 30 years. Tier four means there were standards, ecological standards imposed upon the railroads, uh, clean air standards and so forth, environmental rules. And the railroads, is, to my knowledge, each of them made it well in advance of the deadline. It was to their, certainly to their advantage to be fuel efficient. Um, anyhow, uh, there's some more UP, the largest railroad in the United States. Let's see what else we, Chicago. Um, Chicago's a hub in states here. Uh, freight passenger trains uh, rely on what's what they mean by a diesel engine, by the way, there's a diesel engine, an uh, internal combustion engine, like oh. you have in your car. <laughs> the, internal, the internal combustion engine, the engine uh, turns a generator or alternator, which produces electrical power, which runs uh, electric motors. And that's what's on the wheel, what they call train sets that you see on the bottom of a locomotive. 
and that's the power. So it's it converts it to electrical power. So since all freight locomotives are electrical locomotives, you could say. Anyhow, they move about 1.7 billion tons of of freight on on the on their now. One of the big things that you may say, why is there a gridlock? Well, some of the major shipping that would clog the rails has cut back, such as coal. Coal was, a, oh, I think it was as much as 20% of the business of railroads, unit trains full of coal. But as we turned to a green economy, it was declining, uh, conversion to natural gas. Um, but this means there would be excess space on the railroads. Since that volume is gone, this makes it even stranger. This is a little fact to take with you. How long does it take to cross the US by train? 83 hours, you can, you can count on. Uh, if you leave New York City to San Francisco, a lot of times you see a railroad parked and it's running. Um, this is to their advantage. Um, to keep it going and never shut it off. Uh, it doesn't waste fuel, of course, but the advantage is it really doesn't use much fuel. I think it's like 5% or less of the fuel used by locomotive. How many miles does a locomotive get? Uh, thanks to technology, uh, they can move one ton of freight uh, 500 miles on a gallon of fuel. Very easy to remember. One ton, 500 miles um, on one gallon of gas. So it's very, right now, as a transportation mode, railroads are pretty good. Whoops. Uh, we've been over that. Oh, now, probably the only train people encounter right at the top there are waiting for it as uh, uh, while they're driving and a train comes along and signal comes out. Many freight trains average a mile in length. And if it's traveling 50 or 60 miles per hour, which is pretty fast for a train, it takes a minute to clear a crossing. Uh, very often they're 30 miles per hour. It may take two minutes or longer. And sometimes they're much slower than that. Um, what? Now, here's the thing, they're having gridlock, and we'll get it in the economics of railroads, but look at what the revenue they're pulling in these days. Burlington Norder, $29 billion. UP, $20 billion. CN, another $10 billion. CNX, that's Eastern Railroad, uh, uh, is, uh, that's the old, uh, Chesapeake and Ohio, another merge lines merge, ten billion dollars. There's no reason for this. Uh, uh, now railroads are vital. Every person in the United States needs forty tons of freight every year. Uh, you guys need to adapt a low consumption lifestyle. But there you can see the routes, the major routes uh, right now such as for the intermodal traffic. Uh, this is a big line here, Santa Fe to LA to Chicago. Uh, here's the Western route to the intermodal shipping. This is where we're getting the stuff from China. Here you can see the Mexican line railroad um, going south. Okay, uh, where is we, this most of the time this is hidden. So I just wanted to show you, amazingly, people don't realize this. You all see these intermodal containers and sometimes there are two of them, they call them a double stack. They double they put containers on top. But look at the, the amount of volume of business. These are all over the Chicago area. Very often they're not visible for safety reasons. They have high fencing and things of that nature. Also theft uh, that oh, takes place. So uh, these are all over there. You can see, I told you, Norfolk Southern, 47th Street, that's by my house. Um, I often go there to photograph trains 
it's not easy to do. Um, but some of these are well known. Willow Springs has been around for the Santa Fe forever. That's a major, major uh, terminal for the Santa Fe. Canal Street, that's another one by my house. Now they're putting in, if you see down here, UP, Global One. They're really going all out on this intermodal container. There you can see uh, the major corridors in and out. Um, uh, and the volume of goods even then was uh, to forecast. Now they're not being, yeah, they did materialize. They've got shipping, but they're not shipping anything. So it, this is look great. You got all this business, you're not making any money. Uh, just a little notes about Chicago. As I hear, this is reiteration again, there's 487 freight carriers. Um, there's also 10 private carriers. You, you want to buy a railroad, become a railroad tycoon, might look into it. Uh, also, there's a thing in Chicago that we, if you want to see railroads, go to where a junction is, where two trains meet in different directions. Chicago has 25 of these, which is far more so than any metropolitan area in the United States. Now that may cause problems, junctions, because you've got one train waiting for the other train to come along. It's much like a stoplight on a street corner. One traffic's got to wait for all the traffic to be passed before the next train can move. Now that's one of your cause of gridlock. If you get enough of these junctions where they're all backed up together, you know. Now another thing in Chicago as well, you've got 760 passenger trains traveling through the area, and they are assuming they have priority. The freight's got to wait. Too bad. Now one of the things the railroad's done, it's called maintenance away. And let me tell you, they have not maintained the way. Look at this stuff. Look at that dilapidated shack. This this spot here in the it's amazing. This one in the upper uh, left-hand corner. That's um, Brighton Junction. That's one of the major junctions in the United States. And look what they had operating it. They had old stuff and equipment in this building from 1920. Armstrong kind of switch gear. It's just, I'm going, now they, they recently converted it. And that was only recently. The major junction in the United States is operated identical to the method it was 100 years ago. Uh, this is another one that's right downtown uh, along um, 12th Street. This is, this is a major one. You can see all the commuter lines you have to go through here. Okay, now, how do you operate a railroad today? Another thing they did um, was uh, uh, they operate, they thought they could cut back on track. Many railroads used to even have double track. So you see they went from over 200,000 track to 140,000. And instead of double track, you have single track. And they said that should be no problem because we can, instead of all the old days where you had uh, station agents and sections operating at a time, they still use sections. You could sit down at a computer and this guy thinks he could run the whole railroad and there'd be no problem whatsoever. Where worlds are a little more than running your Lionel train. Uh, it, it has not worked. And attendant to this, you, you know, if you look at railroads, what is the single most important thing are the signaling system. That's what you got to indicate the, the railroads now. If they get a double block all over the system, then you got problems. As I said, the maintenance away extended not only a track removal, but look at this kind of stuff. Track shows to be like it's on the right, not like on the left. Um, here's a standard. You don't have to read this, but 19, uh, your 24 cross toys, um, if they're defective, um, you're in problems. Track comes in 39 foot lengths because that's how much you can take one of them and put it on a flatbed car. But if you got 20, 19 out of 24, the speed is reduced to 10 miles per hour. 
So you aren't going to make much money moving billions of freight at 10 miles per hour. Now, you're supposed to be moving this stuff at 85 miles, which I don't know anybody that does that. Another thing you're doing, not only is they're allowing maintenance away to deteriorate, they're carrying dangerous, more dangerous things like crude oil. Many of you are aware of the uh, incredible explosions, such as it's the first one in La Magenta, Canada, where they burned up the entire town. So they're transporting these valuable substances uh, in da over dangerous track and rail structures. Another thing why this is a concern of everyone is like, hey, Timmy, you there? This is what another thing the railroads are moving. I gave a spoke on this, a program on this to the new guys. Uh, one of the common things, they're shipping nuke juice, I call it, by rail. And there you can see the, uh, the uh, a car laden with nuke juice. For my Lionel train someplace, I got one of these. I bought it years ago for a buck, I remember. Uh, it was on sale, I really didn't want it, but even then, uh, uh, atomic energy disposal is a problem. Now, if you talk to the new guys, they'll tell you, don't worry, Charlie, we got these high-tech rail cars. Real look at that. And this can withstand all kinds of wrecks and nothing's gonna happen. Well, they may have one of those someplace, but this, if you go out and look around, this is the kind of things you see. They're putting it just in covered hoppers, or, or uh, uh, flat uh, cars, just a cover, that's all. That's a standard junk car, scrap metal. Um, hopper and gondola. And here, this is one, they're shipping nuclear waste using containers, the same containers that are used to ship garbage. Out east, they ship the garbage to dumps. Um, and we have garbage trains. Once in a while, you see something like this. But yeah, they're using containers just as you would use for waste. Uh, so there's variations. And this is the last one here uh, regarding railroads in general and why they should be a concern like this. Here's a photograph of the railroad station in Chernobyl. And the last train passed there on April 29th, 1986. So we don't want to end up, we don't want something like this taking place in the United States. And there you go. Thank you. That's it. There you see me outside of the headquarters of the NRA in Ch uh, Chicago. Um, the government agency. Um, anyhow, okay, thank you very much. That's it. And you can have your screen back. Tim, your silence. All right, all right, yeah, there, there you go, Shirley. All right. The first question I have for both of you guys is you mentioned uh, a brief history of the railroad, but you never talked about why there is a bottleneck right now and uh, why there's such a shortage of labor in the railroads. Is it because of the unions? Is it because of the corporate structure? Is it because of the thing? And, and why, why, why can't you run a, a, a railroad on a single day? Okay, they're trying to run longer trains with using fewer people. Now, when you run longer trains, you've got um, speed issues. You're not going to be moving as much. Now, what I didn't get a chance to get into it. You're going to thank you for asking your question. Probably the major reason uh, is the siding. Now, if you have one track. In order to allow other trains to pass, you're gonna to have to put a train on a siding. Now they're operating super long trains, but the infrastructure of the railroads, the sidings are all relatively short in comparison. So those sidings are of no value. 
So you've got one train in front of another. Now, if you could pull one off, it would free up that gridlock, but there's no place to put that train. And I think that's a crucial matter. You don't have enough sightings. They, they cut back on track. And at the same time, that used to be a natural relief. You don't realize if you have two tracks, you can, man, you can load it full of trains. You're cutting it by 50%. You're cutting the, the conductors, the engineers down to nothing. You're making super long trains. Yeah, they're gonna back up. They're gonna be parked. They're gonna be parked outside an intermodal facility. It's not gonna be able to unload. And they're just gonna back up and back up and back up. Does that answer your question, Tim? Well, when I've watched a lot of the uh, specials like Modern Marvels and some other uh, train issues, um, why is the United States having so many problems? Look at India, for example. They run a quite a integrated train system with passenger rail and freight, and they don't seem to have any troubles because it's a nationalized company or is it because uh, that we're commercial and that we expect the uh, railroads to maintain their grades and don't get any tax dollars like the interstates do? There's no, there's no country that has a freight system anywhere in comparison to the United States. I have no idea what you're talking about. And it's not in any mar, 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 modern marvels that I've ever watched. Oh. That, that's, that's, are you kidding? Mexican railroads are, are like I using said, I said old engines that are unbelievable. I they no. And are, are you There's familiar nothing with that compares to the train railroads to be even in even in an unfinanced situation. They're vastly the technology. Oh, this no, not at all. Uh Charlie, the, you uh, at the very start there was a um, uh, a PowerPoint of a very, very large uh, 20 or 30 track uh, railroad yard. Uh, do you know where that was, that railroad yard? Do you know where that is? I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I really don't know. As I say, I put this together within an hour. They're all identical. They all look like that. The largest rail yard in the United States, I think it's the, uh, that one out in uh, Iowa somewhere, I think it's called. Uh, Nebraska. Nebraska, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, Platt, Nebraska. That's right. Yeah, they east to west traffic uh, uh, on the UP. That's in Nebraska and not in Illinois. Yeah, the, the major east west rail yard for the CP. I mean the UP, right, Charlie? Yeah. That's because that's because they can take the trains and service them there too. They do a little bit of maintenance and fuel them up and all that stuff, and then that's where they also can sort the large groups of cars north or south or whatever it's a very amazing process to see what what what, what they go through to how they sort the trains and do everything let, let me tell you that the rail yards in chicago are not are not little tiny things let me tell you corwith yard of santa fe is villa springs norfolk southern it's just unbelievable uh, but yeah they are based around the systems you know there are points for servicing <laughs> locomotives uh defective cars um and so forth i know ups runs express trains too out of their uh, so major sorting facility to go to the west coast all the time you could also always tell that if there's no scans on a package for two or three days it's usually by moving by rail through the ups network when it's going ground, like from example, from like Willow Springs, or you'll see a uh, forest park. I'm sorry, you'll see the one, the big, the big yard down there where they have our sorting center down up by, uh, especially stuff going to the east or west coast. It'll Most of the down. railroads might always have one major yard for their system, um, such as the Southern Railway. Yeah, I've been there down. Is it uh, around Atlanta there? I forget the name. They all, Illinois Central, I think it was Paducah might be. 
regarded. So every railroad has one major yard uh, where they, now that, that's kind of a historical thing, but yes, there's one major yard for railroad. You can find it, you know. Um, Galesburg is an enormous one for the, uh, that's an enormous yard. That's, that's, that's unbelievable, you know. I often would go to Cumberland, Maryland and, and stay there on my way to Washington because that were the, the major yard of the CSX system. And there was plenty to photograph and items of interest around that town. Okay, who's got the next question? Oh, come on, guys. I've got two train experts. Tony White's. Okay. Some... Go ahead. I'm sorry. So this is Sharon. This is not a technical question by any means. But um, there was a movie that was out actually 12 years ago at this point. Time flies. Uh, but they've been showing it again recently called Unstoppable. And it's supposed to be based on a real life story. So do either of you guys kind of remember what was going on in your mind or you know conversations with your colleagues when that happened yeah tony yeah i'm not familiar with that well you should watch it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Watch it. i'll tell you we, we actually did show we show this at our club meetings and they <coughs> are fiction. <laughs> They're pure fiction. Yeah, but, so you know, I'm, I'm sure they I'm sure they took uh, major liberties, but it is supposed to be based on a true story. Well, there's something may have happened, but the way it, yeah, they're pretty good films. Uh, I'm trying to think of the one where the guy that is an ex-con takes over train and stuff like that. I just watched the the great train robbery in Great Britain, Sean Connery. Uh, the yeah, we look at these, but they're they're very free and easy with the facts um, because they have to have a story, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. So as a matter of fact, among some of the railroaders I know, they're a little irritant, but they delight in watching them and showing how it's not accurate as to what they, that's what I mean. They laugh, this is, you know, atomic train and things like that. There's all sorts of safety measures and of course, Every one of the safety measures fails. You know? Right. So, uh, I mean, obviously it is a movie for entertainment. It's not a documentary, but, you know, I mean, it, it does talk about, um, you know, some of the, the dangerous um, freight that they had on board, stuff that you have touched on as well. There's nothing dangerous in railroading. Oh, I don't yeah. even like on occasion to watch it. I'm sorry. I, people in the yard work is... Let's face it, you're dealing with forces. You know, rail car it weighs tons, you know, once it gets rolling, you know, it's <laughs> you're not gonna stop it. Yeah. Uh it is a it, anything the railroaders get paid for, I always say is it's too little, you know. It it's 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 a, it's an occupation where you try desperately. Um, that's why they went on strike. Because of the the accidents that occurred on railroads, they didn't care in the onset. Uh, they just didn't care. Uh, and there was uh, well, a total of employees. Um, that's why they had I, mass I, I strikes. Right now I can't hear. It'll be over in a little while. All right, uh, Jake, I'm gonna mute you, okay? Or can you hear? All right, all right. I'm going to mute you, but just keep going, okay? Because it's a little interference of the meeting. But just unmute All whether right. you're okay. All uh, right, Robert. Okay, Robert's next, and then Kelvin will let you go, okay? 
So Robert, go ahead and ask your question. Already touched on a little bit. Uh, my question was, how frequently are is cargo stolen on the railroads, and what's the biggest theft you're aware of over the past, you know, thirty <laughs> years or so? I can no, answer I mean, some of that. You know, one of the uh, I worked in San Antonio, and uh, th there had been a an organized uh, theft ring that worked from L.A. to uh, to New Orleans on that Southern Pacific route. Uh, and until they finally found out and come to find out some of the special agents were involved with those guys stealing. And uh, so they got, they got uh, caught and, and, and prosecuted, but there is a lot of theft in the rail, in the rail industry. They, they, they can go after a car full of uh, tires or, or, or uh, televisions, you know, it just depends what it is. But there is a lot of theft, but, it, but it, it's, it's a lot less than it used to be because now everything's computerized and, and seen uh, uh, with technology. Well, before, was, that, was that inside work? Was somebody on the inside aware of the cargo? Uh, you know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the groups uh, was an inside job, you know. From uh, it, it included some uh, uh, workers that worked in, in the railroad, and and like I said, even some of the special agents. You know, you know Tim. Also, you asked a question about why India was have such a great uh, infrastructure there, but they really don't. They don't have anywhere near the freight that we have. Now it's true that passenger trains are probably more, uh, they have more in other countries than we do like Japan and you know, and all those uh, high speed uh, corridors uh, that they have. Uh, and that's because we don't have space for uh, fast trains. I mean, I'm surprised, you know, the, even the Asala who, which runs from, uh, from Washington to, uh, oh, to Massachusetts Boston. In, in Boston, yeah. Even that, you know, it was very, it's very hard for them to keep up the speed because there's so much interference in, 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 the, in the land, you know, uh, traffic cars, you know, there's people use more cars than they do trains. Tim, the slowest passenger train in the world is in India. And the advertise, it travels about four miles per hour. <laughs> That's... The slowest passenger service in the world is in India. That's why that's why Superman's Indian. You can run faster than the speeding train. Yeah. Uh, regarding the theft, um, they've done all sorts of things to put up fencing, at least in Chicago. Uh, uh, I used to have a good friend drink beer all the time with, with a guy called Railroad. He was a guard for the Rock Island. They tell me stories all the time. They'd apprehend people. Um, the another thing about theft, though, is um, in some of these terminus centers, I personally believe, and I used to see the reports, the real theft is taking place in trucking and entire truckloads of valuable items will disappear furs and uh, iPods and things like that. Um, especially on the East Coast, uh, they take your trucks and that seemed to be the, the target of the thefts, the, the bad guys, the criminals. Seems to me that railroads were a little difficult. Of course, there aren't sightings, and, but the major metropolitan areas um, you know, they, it's up to the railroad. If they, they feel uh, there's a loss, they don't want to hire security personnel, um, you know, it's up to them. Uh, it's very difficult to get in a rail yard, I assure you. <laughs> it is it's very, you can't even, I'm telling you, I love to photograph trains, but you can't, they're like walls, like fortresses. 
So at least in the metropolitan areas, they, and if you certain places, I still like this in Willow Springs, you could go down a trail and then you come to a point on this trail when it's, and there are like six signs that tell you, let's say, this is a railroad property. You are not allowed to go any further. So you kind of get the message, you know, that you're unwanted and, you know, uh, that's what I mean. No one's going to try anything in a yard, that's for sure. Sure. All right, Margaret, what do you got? Yeah, uh, we, we've been on trains fairly frequently, all things considered. And um, uh, what I noticed is that east-west trains have a lot of interference from freight, like the train that comes from the, and I don't know, it's a famous train that goes from Chicago to Denver to whatever to California. And it's always late, always, always late coming back east. Yeah, with all, I mean, sometimes uh, days. <laughs> but the, but we went down to New Orleans and, the, you know, north-south, and we were, like, ahead of time. We were, like, I don't know, a half hour early or something. So, um, because we took the, what used to be the spirit of New Orleans down there. That was our last, our last trip. We went down and stayed in the French Quarter. And so, um, a few years ago. So, it just seems like, what do you think the future of passenger railways are in terms of, of, um, of people actually using trains for travel and, um, and vacations and stuff, and particularly with the, the um, lack of, of uh, right-of-way on the east-west lines specifically? Tony, you want to you say anything about that? Huh? Tony, you there? Yeah. Well, I tell you the uh, uh, the trains uh, east and west. I used to work, like I said, in San Antonio, to LA and then to New Orleans, and those trains were late because they were the 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 Southern Pacific Railroad delayed on purpose, you know, because they got it, they want to get there their uh, fast trains, freight trains to get through. Mm -hmm. But that's that's really, after after they started implementing fines, that slowed down quite a lot. Now they're running on time. Okay. But, uh, you know, they're not, they're supposed to be given preference over any freight, but that never happens, you know? <laughs> there, Margaret, oh, you done, Tony? Uh, yeah, Charlie, I was going to say, you know, you were talking about those uh, uh, trains carrying uh, nu nuclear stuff. And, uh, you know, I was testifying before a committee. And and so I was able to go to the Yucca Mountain uh, uh, oh, to, wow. inspect, to inspect the uh, uh, where, they, where they were storing uh, the, the nuclear waste. And... Uh, they showed me all the safety things and back and forth, and he wanted to convince me that, that it's safe. Well, I represent uh, Carmen, you know, in 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 the uh, in the railroad. Carmen that inspect those cars every single day, and they glow themselves, you know. Yeah. They get sick. They get sick, you know, from from inspecting those cars. Mm -hmm. Well, I testified to that. You know, the railroad didn't like it, but that's a fact. Uh, and, and, and also I showed him that, that they were not as safe as they said it was. They showed me a canister where they had the nuclear waste and it looks like tin to me where they have it. Uh, and, 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 and so they had a demonstration where they dropped one of those canisters from an airplane and it doesn't, it doesn't bust. You can't convince me of that. You, <laughs> can tell, you, you can tell that you can hit that with a bat and it'll come, come apart, you know? Hmm. Yep. Uh, Margaret, in answer to your question, there are two types of trains on Amtrak, the long distance and, if you wish, the local. So let's take an example, Springfield, Illinois. When I go there, I can catch the Illinois train 
whatever it is, the Sadie Hawkins or something, or Abe Lincoln. And that operates Chicago to St. Louis, whatever. Always on time, never an issue. A lot, another train I can catch at the same thing is the Texas Eagle, which is the longest Amtrak route. Well, if I'm not, if I'm in a hurry, and I've got to get someplace, I take the Illinois train. If I don't mind waiting around, because it's invariably late, I'll catch the Texas Eagle. And there was a debate, and it's been running for a number of years, to the long distance trains were the problem. Now, personally, I don't wreck, like your trip to New Orleans is just about the best kind of route, the longest I would go. It's an overnight kind of train, mm -hmm. a lot of nice scenic stuff, especially when you, you get to the Everglades, different terrain uh, along the main line of Mid-America. Wonderful train, recommend it to anybody. Um, now, there's even a song I, about it. <laughs> now, when I recommend instead of those marathon trains, and I think I thought over the the whole route, just about. I was looking at what trains. There's a thing called rail sail, <laughs> and I I would ride. I was riding Amtrak all over the place. I remember I went to Philadelphia once, and they were laughing at me at the hotel because they said, "What what brings you to Philadelphia?" And I said, "Well, I got this ticket for fifteen dollars." And even though I lived in Philly, I said, what the heck? It's kind of a fun train ride around Horseshoe Curve and all that. And they said, you rode the train simply because you got a cheap ticket. And yeah, that's fun. It was nice. But I would recommend what I would do. I would get off the train. Like if I went to Washington, I would get off in Pittsburgh. I'd spend the day. There's always hotels near the station there downtown. Mm -hmm. And I would see a museum, something else. And it's the trains are always come the next day, precisely at 24 hours when you get off. So you have a full 24 hours. And the next day I'd catch the train and head on into Washington. So I had two little short trips. Of course, you could take the, you know, the that's the capital limited. You know, I'd break up my trip in half. You know, that's what I recommend people do. Get off the train and get back on. Go to Denver, get off, and then proceed on west, Salt Lake City and places like that, you know. Uh, that, that's what I mean. You have your choice of trains. Going to Washington, I could also take the Cardinal. That, that was a longer train, um, very often late. You know, no option of getting off and on anywhere, you know. Uh, but that, that's up to the traveler, you know. But they are always arguing about getting rid of long distance trains. And because the, the local trains, like Illinois operates quite a few trains, I forget the total, uh, you know, that you can catch. And they all, those they operate on pretty good schedules. No, I enjoyed traveling by train. I did. I, 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 we did. We took a sleeper a couple of times, and you couldn't. That was really tough because I always got the top sleeper, and I couldn't even sit up in the sleeper. <laughs> it was bad. Since the credit card started, I have an Amtrak credit card that I use for all purposes, and I <laughs> the young ladies at Amtrak. They're amazed. I have a hundred thousand points, which is probably enough to I could go to and from the moon. <laughs> I am, they didn't believe me. <laughs> but I use it for all my purchases and I get a few points. And then I was getting points for taking Amtrak from work and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it added up. Frequent flyer. <laughs> 
So I, I think there's also a surge in people using trains to visit the national parks. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, they have strips. It's very nice. I've never taken one of them, but yes, in particular out west, what is it? Uh, the the Wyoming there, the the famous park. They have railroad lodges, uh, which are delightful to stay in. Um, I'm trying to think of that major park, Glacier National Park. Oh, okay, not Yellowstone. No, I'm not aware of Yellowstone. They you can go in close proximity to Yellowstone, but Glacier is is the place to go. And there's railroad, massive railroad hotels uh, you can stay at. Um, the train even stops on one side of the town and then the other. So they make it convenient for you. We, yeah. we might have to buy some of your points from you because they are not cheap trips. <laughs> oh no, travel is not. <laughs> That's what I mean. I used to shop around, you know. Yeah, when it comes to cost, it's it might be cheaper flying than going on the on the train, especially if you buy a sleeper. Uh, yeah, but the train's part of the experience. So the, yeah, absolutely. I would recommend, you know, if you've never been on a train, I would recommend you go on a train yeah, and, and, you and spend the night there because you're going to eat, uh, you're going to, you have a restaurant there, you know, and so you got meals and, and you can rest there, you know. We have yeah. our our friend from England there. Many years ago, I took the Southwest Chief uh, and got acquainted with an academic. At the time, she was a young woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the Southwest Chief, the Super Chief, and uh. she travels between. Uh, teaches at University of Arizona and travels back to her home, her family's home in London. And uh -huh. she visit when she comes through Chicago. And we've been acquaintances for many, many, many years. Um, if you'd like a little treat, on, I know you're a railway buff. Um, may I recommend John Betjeman's poems on, the, on railways? What's it again? John Betjeman. He was uh, probably the, the most loved of uh, English poets. He uh, was poet laureate in the certain 60s and stuff, yeah. Um, we, have, uh, we have Margaret Gillette wanting to ask a question, so go ahead, Margaret. Just a second. I uh, really don't even have a question. I simply want to tell you, when I was about four years old, during World War II, we took the train from Dallas to Chattanooga. We took the you had to make reservations way in advance. It was wonderful. It was luxurious. We didn't have a sleeper car even. We just sat in coach. But many years later, after I was married to Grover, we decided to take the train from Dallas to New York City. And he arranged to get two. They were probably sleeper cars. They were across from each other. They were, I really had claustrophobia. You had a bathroom, a toilet in it, and you had a bed. But prior to that, we were trying to decide about our kitty cat, 14 pound kitty cat, not the one I have now but we were going to board her, but I was quite concerned. I thought, well, maybe we should just take her on the train. We're going to have a private room. <laughs> Can you imagine Tim and Charlie and anybody else who has a cat, even in a carrier, the poor thing would have climbed. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my last train trip, but I love trains. I love the idea of trains, but they're not what they were, you know, even in earlier years when they were a luxury trip. <laughs> yeah. There used to be a lot of passenger trains back back in the day oh do you think that okay okay um, I have a well, you Go know ahead. let me just Which say one? that yeah i, I, I have actual travel question. used to be okay kelvin you're next up. after charlie you used ahead, to dress charlie. up on a train and all the men would wear coats sports coats or suits <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. It's a little less, less, little less nostalgic. Uh, the also. Heels and hose and gloves, you know, on the airplanes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I still remember my first air train. I wore a tie and a coat. Old were you? How old were you, Charlie? Oh, I, I, I can't recollect. The, uh, 
I traveled a lot by train before. Um, I still remember I went to grad school. I'm always amazed at this out east. And I took the train. I didn't even consider flying. It was just beyond, you know, I just immediately, I now always think about that. Oh, I said, why didn't I ever think about flying? <laughs> I got off in Grand Central Station. I remember that. Oh. I didn't even think about it at the time, you know. Okay, but right. it has certain amenities. Not everyone is acclimated to it. Uh -huh. uh, I love to bring along provisions, enough food yeah. on my own. I have unlimited coffee, by the way, anywhere on the Amtrak system. Huh. I have a magic cup. Uh, yes. And I get all the free coffee I want. But your well, little day trips are fun. Yeah, to this day, I still have a pass uh, for Amtrak, so I can go anywhere in the country on any train. And I have done all the routes. Uh, and, but today, I, I, get, I try to get my wife to go with me, but she don't want to go anywhere on the train because uh, she used to travel back and forth from, from uh, Texas to uh, Washington to uh, with the kids and you know she didn't it's too long you know yeah avoid those long haul trips <laughs> i mean it's, like you're gonna if you want take the empire builder seattle but fly back it, it's too hard to risk maybe yeah yeah uh you know it, enough is enough you want to you're tired you want to get home you know but uh Travel, your trip should be when you leave your door, you know. And I'll tell you this much, I'm an expert at a high-speed rail on analyzing airlines. I am singularly amazed the extent to which the airlines get away with treating passengers. You talk about train travel. <laughs> airlines are just unbelievable. Unbelievable. There's even talk of the airline passenger bill of rights. They want a law passed. People are fed up these stupid airlines. Well, you know, Charlie, there are uh, some alternatives coming out. Again, I'll, I'll save it for the rebuttal. Um, Cause I, 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 I have a I, I, question. Go ahead, who? Go ahead, Kelvin. I'm sorry. All right. My, my question is, is how much? I mean, I, forgive me for my ignorance on it, but I, you know, uh, how much is American Railways subsidized by the government? Um, and do you see much of a future for the railways? Uh, you know, because of the high speed uh, track, etc., without serious investment from the government. There's no um, and how 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 do you how do you, how do you plan on getting that when you consider the airline uh, lobby and the automotive industry lobby is so so huge? Every single transportation mode is subsidized by the government in some fashion. Granted, every single one of them. If anything, <laughs> the railroads entirely own their roadbed and maintain them and conceivably i would say are the least dependent upon the government now you're mm -hmm. talking about passenger service that may be a different thing but in terms of freight which is our topic tonight they are all subsidized to some extent I mean, well, you won't be able to get anything like the high speed track without a seriously, uh, a serious um, amount of extra money for, for high speed track, etc. Um, no, no. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't get, I don't get the, the fact that you're too populous for high speed rail. Uh, Belgium's got high speed rail, you know, come on. Most popular, most popular, uh, populated country in Europe. You know, um, if you want, we're, it, you're, we're, 
well, there's no high speed rail in, in, in this country except for the uh, the Boston. Uh, uh, Acela trains, right? The, only the Acela train. And, you know, other, other than that, there's none. The next, uh, and, it's, and it's very costly to, uh, to build it. They're trying to, the last 15 years, they're trying to get a train from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, and mm. they haven't been able to fund it. No. One of the problems in that LA Vegas is that you have to have cooperation among the states. Just like we have a Chicago Milwaukee train. Well, Wisconsin doesn't want to pick up the tab. Yeah. Uh, right here in Chicago, that's always a matter of some contention. Like I say, who needs who needs them, you know? Uh, but uh, yeah, there's you know, you have to take each rail project somewhat on a standalone basis. Now the project we have, we do all sorts of calculations on ridership potential. Are these occasionally inflated? Uh, that's been some concern that in rail and transportation projects, the ultimate ridership is inflated and never materializes. At other times, it is now. We are looking at trains. Are also looking at taking away pa existing passengers. And anybody in their right mind, like the East Coast, it any, a train is infinitely superior to any sort of airline mm. travel. <coughs> Easy and without without debate. Now in Europe, some of the cities I understand. The catalysts for high-speed trains actually were the mayors, in particular mm -hmm. mayors of cities that wanted to foster the development of the of the city. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's going to be some incentive. Now you talk about financing, you miss my talk, pal. How much do we breaks do we give these stupid factories? Yeah. In Wisconsin. I'm not saying it, it won't, it, it, what I'm saying, it will need a huge amount of government finance. And considering the uh, weight of the airlines and uh, automotive lobby, how do you think, I, I, what do you think the prospects of getting that passed? I couldn't quite hear you. Well, considering the, the weight of the lobbies from the airlines and the uh, automotive industry, What's, what do you think the chances of getting uh, a huge amount of government subsidy for new track, et cetera, is? Well, transportation benefits community. Anybody in their right mind knows that. <laughs> Excuse now, me. Uh, when they, they're giving $3 billion, the state of Wisconsin, I think it's over $3 billion to some Chinese to build a factory which will close down in 20 to 30 years and leave a ghost community. Do you think that's a good investment? Yeah, I, 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 I have a little bit of take. I take up with the phrase you used some moments before, anybody in your right mind as, uh, with regard in Washington. You know, but the railroads pay their I own. I mean, really, really as, 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 as government in recent years been showing it, uh, uh, about anything in their right mind. Now, certain routes, certain routes where you're talking passenger, I mean, they're never going to pay their way. And no. there's no incentive to build one. We see, right, there's a project to put high speed train to Boise, Idaho. You said, who in the hell is going to go there? <laughs> how, many, how many passengers are going to be death ending to Boise, Idaho? <laughs> hey, they, they have two shirts there that says, I've been to Boise and read the escalator. I, I said, I go, hey, yeah, it's all proposed and talked about, you know. Uh, Indiana has. I don't know, but what's more important is who needs to go to Boise, Idaho, really fast. <laughs> 
you know, they, for long range time, you're maybe not familiar. They want to connect the three cities in Ohio. I don't know why they don't. That one is a given. That's a given. Uh, we've yeah. got we've, 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 we've got a lot of controversy. There's um, this, there was a plan for going to high, high, a planned high speed railing up from London to to Manchester and Leeds, um, and it's been hitting all kinds of problems. Planning, um, it's been seen as it's it's been consistently been looking more like a white elephant. Um, how that's it, but the thing is, we're, we're still so far behind Europe. I mean, the the, the channel comes in, uh, you know, you get a high speed uh, train that'll take you right across the, across the channel, and as soon as it hits Britain, it just it slows. It, you know, it's down to a mile an hour, something, yeah. Well, what happened in England, I've actually been studying a lot of British rail history, I've spoken on the early years of it, but. What happened in Great Britain was you had, at one time, the rail network was the envy of the world. They were supplying the colonies with steam engines. Yeah. They yeah. took pride in running uh, that uh, Royal Scott, the fastest yeah. train in the world. They never yeah. would acknowledge that we had a faster train here in the United States. They said that's impossible. Mm -hmm. The only people that could have a train going at over 100 miles per hour are we are the only ones. Now you came up and you broke it up because somebody came along and said, "Oh, let's privatize it." Guys like Timmy, let's let's have the capitalists and yeah. we'll break it up. And it turned into a disaster. Oh yeah. Let's talk oh, about yeah. not getting anywhere. Gridlock. There were uh, railroads. We do, we do have the best excuses for, for late trains, though. Um, leaves on the line was one excuse. The wrong type of snow was another excuse. Um, yeah, it's... I ride, I ride to Manchester uh, Liverpool train quite often, and uh, I get a cheap one. <laughs> the, uh, the Stevenson line. I got a uh, question for all you guys. How would I take a train to Albuquerque, New Mexico? Very easy, man. That's a, I've done that a dozen times, Tim. Uh-huh. Albuquerque has a beautiful station, restored station, plenty of economic, economic hotels right downtown. I've done that and gone to Santa Fe. Is a, you can catch a little commute to Santa Fe instead of staying there a little pricey in Santa Fe. It's right relatively close nearby. There's a commuter rail train. The, I don't know, the road runner. So yeah, travels through the uh, Indian territory, the Pueblos. Albuquerque is a major stop. As a matter of fact, they still have a tradition in Albuquerque that the train will park there for one hour. And in order to service the trains, they wash all the windows so that you get a nice scenic view of the West. <laughs> and the Indians sell their Indian Indian souvenirs, pottery and so forth. Now, the guy I was traveling with, he said, the heck with this pottery stuff. I mean, I, I some guy had a taco truck. So I've got a big burrito, but he went to a liquor store. They got a a pint of hooch. Uh, but Albuquerque is a major terminus. And I've always been on the Santa Fe, beautiful station. And it also has integrated traffic to the buses. So you can get all over the place from there. Nice little trip, actually. Good place to get off. That's about enough tra train travel at one time. How long does it take, roughly? A day, about a day. So you could get a coach and be comfortable, huh? Pretty much on a train yeah, like that. Yeah, you take coach, sure. Okay.
Yeah, I, you know, yeah, that that would be no issue, you know. You know, because I know that the, the some of the train services they just started one. What's that country that has a devil's nose on it for the trains? It's known as the Devil's Nose, where they go back and forth up, up on top of a hill. It's in South, South, South America. I don't know. I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember it. I mean, you know, I would think that you guys who know the trains pretty well uh, would, would know something like <laughs> that. You know. All right, Robert, you got a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, I haven't been in a train since, God, I was, I'm 36 now, since I was like eight years old when I went from New York to Florida once. Um, and I'm wondering, on the passenger uh, cars, have they updated everything like, uh, you know, I'd expect they would with Wi-Fi or places to plug in your phone and your laptop on longer routes? Yes, they do. Oh, that, yeah, I was just curious. Long ago. Yeah, long most, ago. most trains have Wi-Fi, yeah. They're they're nice. They they are beautiful compartments, you know. And you know when you make your reservations online, they tell you if the, you know what kind of things the train has on it, and what kind of stuff is in the station too. They restore the cars right here in Indiana, and they refurbish them. Bring them brand new cars. I uh, some of the modern equipment is really cool. California has some nifty rail cars, man. Uh, California is really they take trains seriously, and they're really nice, uh, modern, up to date, uh, contemporary design. You know, you can have tables, relax. You know. Look like at airlines, you know. Like, what do they give you in an airline? 18 inches? <laughs> oh, Eight, like, like a prisoner. Like on a slave ship. That's terrible. I oh, know. All right. Are you got all right? Um, another couple questions, if you don't mind, and then they think we'll get into rebuttals after this. Um, are you familiar with the Bright Line service in Florida? Yeah. How about you, Tony? Anything you, you want to comment on it? You're muted, Tony. I'll talk then. There's a. No, no, I'm not familiar train. with it. Go ahead, Tony. Finish. Not, I'm not familiar there's... with it, uh, Tim. Okay, there's, go ahead, Charlie. There's about six or eight um, high speed rail projects floating around. Dallas, Houston, like we're trying to have New York, Chicago, which is kind of a lengthy one. Shorter trains, uh, the Carolinas, they're looking at, they're all over the place. If you go to the National High Speed Rail Association, you can keep up with these, as I said, big movement in, o in Ohio. They have a triangle connecting Cleveland, Cincinnati, Columbus. Um, different projects under any stage of development. You know, uh, you could look their stuff over. They have high spoke statewide high speed rail associations often. You can see the feasibility of it. Now, the problem with some of these projects, and I don't want to get too deep into this, is when you design a passenger service, you have to have city pairs. Now the bright line is like connecting Disneyland to Miami, which is one city pair. Now, if you take our route, New York to Chicago, <laughs> you can connect, think of the multiple trips you could take to all the various cities in route, Philly, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, um, what have you, into New York, Boston, so they have multiple city pairs. Now that's why we're saying our project is more feasible because it's not a barbell A to B, it's an actual system. And if you have feeder lines, Detroit and so forth, 
uh, the, the city fairs make it, uh, we say, an attractive proposal. Okay. Um, all right. Are there any more questions for our presenters tonight from anybody in the audience? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Sorry about that. Tim, let me. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, this is not a question. I just wanted to say the devil's nose is in Ecuador in the Andes Mountains. Uh, okay, thanks, Sharon. <laughs> I know they just started, they just recently restarted their aging train service there and now have a steam train that goes that route now for tourists. All right, who else? The, uh, could I just say something about that, Tim? Go ahead and then I One of the only prize nose art that I'm familiar with is on the old Baltimore and Ohio. They had a starburst um, at some of the early diesel engines, like stars in the sky, America over the Capitol, because they served that area. And as they started replacing diesels, it was considered something of a, a prize if you could find one of those star engines someplace, because uh, they were getting rarer and rarer. And I don't know why, <laughs> if they got one, they'd get all excited. All right, Tony, I think you wanted to add something too, please. Yeah, what I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, it's, I, I've been working on short, short, uh, High speed rails and 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 not even high speed rail, but just short lines for a passenger for 45 years. Uh, the uh, there's a, there's a train that we've been trying to implement in Texas from Dallas to uh, Houston to San Antonio and back around like Texas Triangle, and it never materializes. It's too costly. Now. You know, Lipinski's trying, he's been trying to work uh, all kinds of short line uh, railroads, uh, high, uh, passenger rails, but they never get anywhere. Again, it's been 30 years, 45 years, you know, and they never, they never accomplish anything. Well, what do you but think? It, of but, it, but it does keep in business those consultants, you know. Okay, Margaret, go ahead. You have a question now. Yeah, I want to know why the, this effort doesn't go through Des Moines, it goes through Osceola, Idaho, or I mean, uh, Iowa, which is like 40 miles south of Des Moines and is not close to anything. <laughs> we tried to, we tried to take the train. Tomas went to uh, Ames, uh, to Iowa State in Ames, which is 80 miles north of Osceola. And I thought the train would go into Des Moines and we could rent a car where it, goes into Osceola, which is, I mean, please. Anyway, that's just a thought. Why does I, I it do that? To, I can answer that. There is a gap in Amtrak. And in Illinois, it's those trains straight west from Chicago into Iowa. And that was Chicago Northwestern Territory entirely at one time. Now, if you take the Illinois, Illinois Amtrak routes, that route going to Rockford on further west uh, was the CV and Q route as well. Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy out of Aurora. Now there is a gap there. I, I know that because I was thinking of taking the train to the Iowa State Fair, and I think you end up like 80 miles away, and which was uh, not workable. But that is the gap um, that needs to be filled. It's been discussed and discussed. I don't know the current status of it. I haven't heard anything, but there was acknowledgement that that portion uh, was underserved. Okay, who's there's, next? There's, I'm sorry, there's just two, there's two colleges there. I, University of Iowa and, and uh, Iowa, I think Iowa City, I think, and uh, which is on the way to Des Moines and then Iowa State in Ames about 40 miles north of. 
Uh, Des Moines on I-35, I think it is. It's inconceivable that there's no train to Madison, Wisconsin. That's right. There's no train to Madison. There's I've, a only been to Madison. I've only been to Madison once. You know, <laughs> I deal in academics because we had to rent a car in order to get there. No, there's the Van Galder bus service that goes from Chicago. Yeah, I know, but it's... I know. <laughs> They're, nice. They're nice. I have, I have gotten there because I represented employees at the Forest Products Laboratory there. And I said, oh, man, it's a, it's, you, you can get there. But yeah, Milwaukee <laughs> Station, you transfer. And, uh, yeah. It's... You know, it's inconceivable. A beautiful train station in Milwaukee. Well, why didn't they? Well, you gotta have a railroad, man. There's no railroad. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, we went. We, we did a family trip up to Milwaukee with the and we saw the the art museum there. It's just incredible on the lake with the wings and all that. Yeah. And the, and the Capst Mansion. <laughs> that they refurbished and all that other stuff. Talk about capitalism. Be, <laughs> used to be Chicago and Minneapolis was a big route. And I hardly talked about today. Yeah. No, you can't. I, I, you know, yeah, you can take the train, but man. Used to be that's the route of the 400 and the Northwestern used to advertise it as a premier train. Mm. Now you go there, it's like there's one door in the gigantic station. <laughs> one door out of the whole place. They have weddings there and everything. It's like a giant menial, but only one door. If you look around, that's where you catch the train. Because <laughs> that's <laughs> I mean, where, where do you catch the train here, guys? I said, way over there in the back, Charlie. A little sign that said, catch train here. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, they're not, they're not you, yeah. All right, are you guys familiar with any of the hobo channels on YouTube where the guys, uh, uh, they got a couple out there that I've watched for a while where they actually hop freight trains and go across the country? No. My father was a hobo. I didn't even know that existed. They're there, they're, they're there. Um, anyway, I could do a rebuttal on it real quick. Uh, My father was a hobo. He came from Rhinelander, left the farm. The way he told me the story, he got paid in silver dollars. He was carrying all this silver dollars and uh, made his way to Chicago. Um, yeah, I said, this is, this is kind of easy to tell people. My father was a hobo. <laughs> Oh, is that back, Rudy, is that back in the 1890s? And on top of it, I had Uncle Rudy. He lived in, a, in an old boxcar. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he got it. Stole it from the railroad or something. Yeah, well, okay. Any more questions from anybody else here in the audience? All right, seeing it's none, who wants to do a rebuttal tonight? I know Charlie's got one. Margaret's got one. Uh, Bob, do you have one? I guess Bob Manor doesn't. Who else? I know I do. Let me write this down. I don't have pen and paper handy, so we'll just have to go. So I got Margaret, I got Charlie, I got myself, and then who else? All right. I'm going to take about maybe eight or 10 minutes here just to show you guys some stuff sharing screen now it's not going to be a video or anything but i just want to show you some of the incredible stuff that i've been able to accumulate over the internet on some of this train stuff that i'm surprised uh you guys may not know about um so with that i'm going to start my rebuttal and i'm going to share my screen and the first thing i'm going to share with you is if you go to up, up here to the, uh, can you see my screen well enough there pretty much? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what you can do here is go into, uh, go into for example, a uh, hobo, H-O-B-O, YouTube channels. 
you're going to see some stuff in here. Hobo stroke, train, tr freight train hopping feature film. You can see a ton of stuff in here where he gets uh, he gets quite a bit, you know, hobo shoestring. Quite a bit. And these guys have got a ton of... They got quite a bit of what they do and what life is like on the rails. As a matter of fact, to dig deep enough, there was one guy who went to Canada as a, on a vacation and went train hopping. They found out who he was, and when he got to the border for a second trip to Canada, he was barred from coming into Canada. There's other things, too, that uh, there's some extensive uh, Amtrak. If you just take Amtrak travel logs, you're going to find out that there's a ton of people who, if you go to the videos part of it, um, you're going to find out that they have a lot of people, you know, uh, on here that 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 uh, if you dig a little bit more you're going to find that a lot of people um have uh give extensive uh, things on on the travel things for example now as far as transit's concerned there's a real good channel called rm transit this is out a guy out of canada and he uh does quite a bit uh with with his youtube channel as well you know, he, he talks all about transit and everything else, what he does and everything. And he uh, he gets into it quite a bit. Um, you know, so he's, he's quite in there. And then there's another one. There's just a whole bunch of stuff out here. Where I found out a lot about London and everything else was uh, if I just go to uh, the tube in London, you're going to find two. And then you go to the video section in here. Um, and I know this is a, a little bit more than more than in depth what you want to do, but if you look in here too, you're going to find how to use the underground trips from locals, London Underground, the tube. They got a ton of a ton of stuff. The thing is, Chicago doesn't have a lot of transit related videos on the L. They do have uh, some stuff, but you know it's just it's just incredible the amount of, of rail footage out here. Matter of fact, you can put on the Russian trains and find all about the, uh, you know, you can you can go on into the longest train journey in the world from Russia to Siberia, you know, on their major east-west route. And what they didn't tell you is that there's a second one that was built too um, in the mid '70s for uh, mili mainly for military traffic, but they don't uh, they don't um, come in here. But there's a ton of stuff on here with it and then of course too you know if you just take uh, train journeys here we go uh th this it is incredible to see what you do. Uh, there's just stuff on australia los angeles things it's smithsonian channels got some documentaries on uh um what they call uh extreme there's one that you know, it's just there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that you can find. I don't know if I can find the train stuff, but it, I, I don't think I can. But maybe that maybe they got it here. Um, the Queen like, died. That's why. Right, right, right. But air disasters, all kinds of stuff like this. We just go into. Uh, but anyway, it, what I'm trying to say is that there's a ton of stuff. There's a real good one. Extreme trains, which is actually. Uh, uh, another this one right here this is a 2008 documentary this guy actually does pretty decent uh, on the stuff it's a TV series where he actually does trains about the, the, the circus and a lot of other stuff you can get a lot of this stuff just up on um, just up on the, the, the freight trains and uh, how they all operate and everything else it's just amazing I'm not I'm surprised that you train buffs don't know enough about this stuff because this is where I'm learning a lot about it you know uh, freight trains, everything else, and the, and the, and the, and the Russian-Ukrainian train system and how after you get like 30 miles away from a rail yard in Russia, that's where they're having so much trouble with their logistical trouble. And there's just a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that, that is so much in here. Um, the one thing that I can encourage you guys, if you're into transit and everything else, just put uh, rapid transit in, into the search engine and you just go right to YouTube you're going to find all kinds of stuff in here, you know, Chicago Community Trust, the train, train council. There's a ton of, ton of stuff up here that, that's really good. 
you, like I said, you just have to do a little bit of digging, but you can uh, find a lot of stuff from people who are actually ride buses. And they had one on here that I watched not too long ago it was all about uh, this guy going by train all the way from like uh, New York to Washington, D.C. by local trains. Said so it took him two days, but he was absolutely uh, in, 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 in out with a lot of the uh, things on it. You can find out a lot of a lot of different stuff on it. But what I am saying though is I, I I tend to like sometimes I've ever taken the train and you know my preferred mode of uh, travel is just get in a car and go on our magnificent interstate system. I still think that the best way for me to travel if I'm just doing a short trip in Illinois or even a overnight trip is just to drive. I still like it, but I can see the the allure of the train because. If it operated anything like out of Switzerland or some of the places in Europe, I'd be more inclined to take the train because you can meet people and you're a little bit relaxed. Like I said, there is something about not being behind the wheel and traveling a long distance, but you just can't really do that here right now. You know, like I said, the interstate highway is my <laughs> main mode of transportation these days because I'm you know, in and out of Chicago, in another Franklin Park. Thing is, I could take the train from Elgin to Franklin Park every day if I wanted to, but it's, you know, other than the $13 it would take to do round trip, it's still cheaper in, in gas to drive there. You know, though it is getting a little bit more uh, competitive with uh, with uh, and with uh, Chicago and Northwestern. And I've done that more than once because if I had a car breakdown or something like that, our friend Paul needed to borrow my vehicle. He would drop me off at the train station in uh, Elgin and I'd take the train down to, to a Franklin Park. And I'll tell you, you know, it's something when you get on that commuter train and it just even do the people watching or something, you arrived a lot more refreshed than you were driving, you know, but it does take about an hour and a half, you know, by the time you go door to door versus about an hour with car, it, it, it can make a difference. And I missed the train once in Elgin and had to wait another hour before the next one came, but it wasn't so bad. But I can tell you, though, if you if you get the right connections and the right route and have a little bit more time on your hands, the train is definitely the way to go. Um, I've done it myself, just going into the city a couple of times. And even on the L itself, you know, if you park up at Cumberland, you can get into the city pretty, pretty nice on a on a. Uh, you know, especially when you're trying to fight traffic on rush hour. The only thing that I don't like and the reason I like driving into the city is because at night when you're done with your venue and it's 11 o'clock at night, you're, you can usually be home within 45 minutes to an hour driving. But anyway, that's my take on the trains and uh, look around because there's a lot out there. There's also another documentary, if you just Google it, called uh, The World's Busiest Railway. And there's a four-part BBC documentary on the... Uh, train system in uh, India and as you dig a little bit more Tara, there's this one host is called Chris Tarrant amazing train journeys does it and then of course if you really like travelogues Michael Palin did a lot of them you know and I think Kelvin you'd know all about that you know pull the pole and circle the world and all that stuff it was quite something to see anyway there's, my an, um, there's another guy you might be interested in um He's an ex, um, he's an ex, he's ex uh, uh, conservative minister, Michael Paul Sello, and he does great way away journeys. Great way away journeys? Yeah. Um, yeah, Michael Paul Sello. Okay. It might be something to look at, but I do know I've watched them at home and here at the house, and it's, it's just amazing what you find. And even now, if you go into the, just type hobo, into the YouTube search engine, you'll find all kinds of guys. They they don't they done nothing but uh, they're YouTube famous. They got a smartphone and they can make their old YouTube channel mm -hmm. on, on freight hopping. <laughs> it's amazing the culture they have on that stuff, you know. And they said, you know, they might wait twenty four hours to get a freight train to the right thing, but these guys know their stuff. Anyway, enough said. Who's got the next rebuttal? I'll go. Okay, um, Margaret, go ahead. <laughs> Years ago, I, I I didn't even know who he was, but I went to listen to you, Utah Phillips, who was an old wobbly, and um, he was a, a hobo and and all of that. And uh, he he said he when he met his his 
wife who he's married to at the time, and I assume stayed married to, um, he said she saved his life because he was hanging out and not taking care of himself and all that other jazz. But he had a great line, which is the wild, wild west, where the men are men and the sheep are nervous. So I really do like that line. Anyway, my uh, cousins, my cousin worked for the railroad. He, um, in, during the Second World War, so he was exempt from going into the military. And his brother was exempt because he was a judge, but his younger brother went and was in the Navy. So they had uh, uh, kind of a typical, well, no, they didn't have a typical family uh, experience in the Second World War because most families, everybody went, including my family. But um, they, uh, tried to they were they tried to keep hobos off of the trains and there were all the and i'm sure they were not nice about it at all and so they would go in the yards and and go underneath the trains and and uh, throw people off the or have them arrested or whatever it was that they did with them and um that was that was the whole thing and and that he he and he and his family lived all over the West um, after the war in Sheridan, Wyoming, and in Galesburg, Illinois, <clears> and, <throat> all, and um, you know, just all over uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. So um, they, that was the other side of, of the picture, the people who, who actually were the managers of the railroad from the hobo picture. So, um, I've always liked to ride trains. We went up to Steamboat Springs and from Denver, and that was really a beautiful, because that was a tourist trip and went up in the mountains and you stayed all day and then you came back down on the train. And then, you know, those kinds of things, it, 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 that doesn't run anymore, actually. <clears throat> and um, I haven't gone cross country to California, but I've gone from, um, from Chicago to Denver and from um, and then from Chicago up uh, to the, to uh, Windsor and up into Canada and then across southern Canada from um, Ontario to um, Toronto to Quebec City and that was really a nice trip and um, very comfortable, not the Chicago to Toronto, that was like nine hours, so that was long. But you know, you buy stuff at the charcuterie or whatever in, in uh, Toronto, and then you eat on the way going down to uh, Chicago, or, and vice versa. So, you, you know, I think it's a, and we went to, and like I said, our last train trip was, to New Orleans, and um, that was that was that was a nice that was an interesting trip. And then when we went around to look at colleges for our son, we took the trains a lot of times to different places to Minneapolis, um, I, <laughs> lots of adventures. Uh, the trains and the Greyhound buses, which are an extraordinarily interesting way to travel. But uh, you have to be. Yeah, hang on. Alert. Just, just, just give me a second. I, mute yourself, Tim. So, um, so you know that it's it's seeing America from seeing really seeing Americans, really seeing Americans is very interesting way to travel. That's all. Next, who's next? You know, on my on my train travel, I met a lot of a lot of different types of people in the on the train. Very interesting uh, professors and uh, retired people that that you know just gave you great stories about things. You know, uh, 
a lot of very, very friendly people. Uh, and, and like I said, I used to, since I went free, I traveled all over the country on Amtrak. And I used to take my family well, and all my kids during the summer, you know, and, and I had six kids traveling with me on the, on the family uh, car, you know. Okay, next. Margaret, anybody? Carrie? Carrie Shad? I don't think he's listening. I don't I don't think so. Okay, Kelvin, any you got any? <laughs> uh no, not really. Um it just what it's you just like? to you guys talk. I mean, it, it's it's the archetypal America, you know, the the the, the, the freight train and the, you know um uh the, the hobo and, and and stuff, you know. Um what's it like riding the tube? Um packed. It is if you try you, you know you, you get you get on it's it depends, you know, depends on what time it is as well. I mean, late at night, you know, it's um it's it's the clash, you know, it can be a bit scary as well, you know. Um uh, down at the train station, the tube station at midnight. Um it's yeah, it, it, but I used to I worked in London in 79, 80. Um I commuted on the you know the, and it was it's amazing how many passengers tube carries every day. It's like a million passengers a day or something more. Um, and it's yeah, it, it's amazing that it just it, it just operates an incredibly efficient system. The the trains in the rest of the UK vary, you know. Actually, to, to be honest, the long distance trains aren't bad. The uh, the commuter ones can be a bit. I tell you what is good the uh, the tram system in Manchester. Really? They have, they have yeah, they have a metro system in Manchester that's part of the ground, part of overground, mostly overground. Um, that really is uh, very efficient. Well, I, I know I was uh, one time down in Dallas, and I was looking at their light rail system there, and it was incredible how efficient it was in Dallas. Even you'd not think that. Dallas would have some kind of public transit like that, but it was incredible. I, yeah. I just want to add, in, when we went to Spain, we went everywhere on trains. And they were, we went on the long distance train from Madrid to um, uh, Malaga. And uh, it, it was a high speed train and it was a half hour late and they refunded our fare. Really? Oh. <laughs> So, but, but my son, uh, you know, Tomas just moved from Barcelona to Seattle because of work. But in Barcelona, he lived, you know, he had an apartment kind of downtown, but he went a block to one train and he went a, a different direction uh, on another block to a different train. So, he, and then he he moved up to a little town outside, or well, it's not a little, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a small city just north of Barcelona called Badalona. And it was the same thing. You know, they, they have a much denser population. And so when they put, they have an, an, a, a, an amazing public transit system there that you can take a train anywhere, and where he was in Barcelona, he was a half hour from any place in Barcelona. And in Badalona, he was uh, he was less than an hour away from any place in Barcelona or in Badalona or you know around. And you could take long distance a long distance train. He was a, a block away from the station to the long distance train. So it was just incredibly easy. And he's really a public transit system. He lived in Los Angeles and did not have a car. He used he lived close to where he worked and he used his bicycle to go to work. So he um, you know he's really into the public transportation business, and you know, and he he loves Barcelona because of that. And he's 
unhappy that he has to go to Seattle to find a decent job. Oh, well, <laughs> so there you are. That's all I wanted to say. Um, there's some good, uh, good, uh, if you guys don't mind, there's like a short three minute uh, video that I can talk. It's about Switzerland's public transport system. And I think it might shed a little light if Charlie doesn't object or anybody else. Yeah, I do object. Come on, we're running on time. Okay, anyway. You want but, to learn uh, about Switzerland. No, it's good. Electric about, trains, come on. It's a good transit system. Anyway, enough said. I'll put both. Where? Yeah, it's <laughs> All right, anyway, Charlie, you want to, you guys want to wrap up? T Tony and uh, Aunt, uh, Charlie, and then we'll. Uh, well, I, I can wrap, I can wrap up uh, by, by saying that uh, even though I'm retired, I continue to lobby for, uh, uh, for, uh, Amtrak, and, and, and I know a lot of the congressmen still there that when I was there, and I used to uh, take them to lunch and dinner, and and so we have a very good relationship with most of the people that are still there. They're as old as I am now, but you know we started <laughs> very young. Nancy Pelosi was uh, was a young girl back then when I was young, <laughs> mm. and, uh, and so. You know, let me say that I will continue to lobby for the train system and for the railroad retirement, especially, and and that Amtrak will continue to be funded. I just wanted to say that as a final thought. Okay, Charlie, what about final thoughts for you? All right, I got all kinds of things to talk about. First of all, I thank everyone for coming tonight, and uh, I'm going to be eclectic as usual. Quickly, a few things here. If you want to be a hobo. Uh, from what I understand, they have a, they call it a well car. And you see those double stack containers. And either end, you can ride, you're out in the open, but you might have to bring a board with you too. But um, it's preferable to riding in a gondola, which isn't too cool. Um, I knew a guy who was riding in a gondola and there was pipe and the pipe started going towards the back where he was. But if you get in a well car, they call it, uh, with those containers, you can easily get a nice place to ride. The hobos, the actual hobos from the 30s were young men. Generally, the family couldn't afford to feed them, whatever, they weren't necessarily needed on the farm, but they were all teenagers for the most part, not grizzly old guys like you kind of think. Um, by the way, Utah Phillips, I, I had dinner with Utah Phillips. I'm a wobbly and we on the 100th anniversary, we put on a concert uh, featuring Utah and some other guys. Uh, they're trying to put a memorial uh, boxcar or, or caboose someplace. I get solicitation for funds. Um, if you wanna go on the internet, the videos you might wanna look at are the track gangs. The Smithsonian has some old movies. These guys had cadence songs. And a lot of the lyrics are dirty. <laughs> Talk about women, getting women and stuff. But the cadence songs of the track games, the Gandhi dancers, that's how they would work together. Uh, and they had rhythmic ways of, they made up all sorts of stanzas. The CTA has the videos of each route and their high speed compressed footage. So you can ride the entire orange line is in like five minutes. And they're kind of fun videos. Um, or, you can, or the entire brown line in like three minutes. It goes real fast blazing through the city. The CTA is known for that. Uh, somebody mentioned the Russian railroad. Unlike the American Transcon Railroad was planned in infinite detail. I've seen the reference books. I'm amazed to which there was nothing left, it was all plotted out. And, and the, but the Russians, they were just the opposite. They just put together a cruise and built the railroad kind of as they went along, one day to the next as they found the terrain, a little different approach. Somebody mentioned the circus train. There were circus trains, red and blue. They would get cars and refurbish them. And all the parts were identical so that they could take care of it. The, the train itself 
They were pulled by engines from the railroad they were on. They didn't have engines. So they, if they came to Illinois, they'd be pulled by Illinois Central engines um, and there'd be no issue, but they didn't have their own engines, but the train itself was belonged to the circus. The other thing is they'd have elephant parades and things like that. That's because that's the closest they could get to the arena where the circus was. It wasn't necessarily, you know, promotion. Um, regarding videos, Tim, there are hundreds of videos on each railroad. Railroads of Kansas City, Chicago, KC. Uh, however, these are commercially sold and they're not on into the internet. I must have easily several dozen of these. They come on sale. I used to get them for sometimes 10 bucks. Trains of Los Angeles, trains of the UP. They give them the name, colorful names. And you're not, unfortunately, these are not on the internet because they're commercially available. Um, uh, the, the, most of the railroad people also read books. I'll tell you a little story. There's a guy who's selling books at the, uh, the railroad club I was at in Union Station. And I bought this book on Amtrak. And some guy mentioned to me, he said, why don't you get that autograph? And I said, well, I might. He said, the guy over there who wrote it is a member of our club. Uh, uh, the... Um, um, Let's see, export, I can't remember that. Oh yeah, there's publications on every railroad in town. My friend filmed the Rock Island uh, for years. He, he filmed it and later on he sold it to video, but they sell those things commercially. So he's got all kinds of videos he saved up on the Rock Island and uh, he gave me a copy of the, the video that they put out. Um, a lot of the hobby involves going out and photographing trains, which means you can do nothing other than pick out a spot where you think a lot of trains are going to come and have your camera gear ready. And if you're lucky, trains come by. Sometimes they don't. I was out with Lois one time. I remember one holiday. We waited all day from 10 o'clock until about five o'clock. And not one train <laughs> came by. Um, the trip to Canada is a real good one. The rail pass, Margaret mentioned it. Rail pass is pretty cool. The Eastern section, maybe four hours between stops and stations. Uh, a really nice trip, highly recommended. Uh, the Can among Canadians, they have vias a little bit different. And then instead of a dining car, they have uh, like a steward comes and has a cart and comes down the aisle and sells refreshments. And last of all, I have my high speed rail project and I aspire someday to become a railroad tycoon when I make a lot of money and, <laughs> and rich. I, I'll come back and visit you guys. Thanks for coming out tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. Okay, and then at this point, I'm going to close our recording on the College of Complexes. I do have it this time, like instead of last week. So, guys, have a good night, and I'll keep the Zoom call open. Who wants to host it?